a woman sighs as others rest their hands on hers. Touch is taboo in our society and in our culture. They nod and tap her thigh. So we learn an attitude that we internalize from a very young age. Look, don't touch. Look with your eyes, not your hands. And as we grow up, those thoughts are really embedded deeply within us, and we have to do a lot of work to kind of unlearn, relearn, recenter, and then apply the norms that we feel right about that do fit us as deafblind people, because hearing sighted norms do not. A sketch in white on a black background of hands resting over each other. A title, protactile, a language of touch. A signer points and taps on a woman's thigh. Okay. This is Rebecca. Rebecca signs as the other two rest their hands over hers. First of all, I would like to thank you both. Rebecca touches the other's chest. Sincerely for coming and sharing your time with me today. Today I will be learning a whole new language. All the people I will be interviewing are deafblind. Encapsulates protactile. The voices you hear are interpreters. In another group, a woman leans her head towards others. And so this is a story that may unfold in an unfamiliar way. These are the creators and teachers of ProTactile, or PT, and they will be taking us inside their world, a world experienced and expressed wholly through touch. Our biggest organ is our skin, so why don't we use it? <laughs> We're really touching something. What is its texture? What is its temperature? What is its shape? Deafblind people typically get information last. How do we know that people even are around us? We don't if they don't touch us. In old footage, a woman rests her hand over a man's hand as he fingerspells. Historically, deafblind people have had to rely on others, interpreters and support service providers. They have traditionally communicated with American Sign Language, or ASL, or Tactile Sign Language. But ProTactile is completely different from anything that's come before it. It is a language created by the deafblind for the deafblind. Having agency is at the center of ProTactile. It allows for direct contact with people in their environment without someone in between. ProTactile fosters group communication, deeper connection, and community. Rebecca, who has long brown hair and dark glasses, walks along a city sidewalk with a mobility cane. I'm Rebecca Alexander, and I have Usher syndrome. Usher syndrome is a rare genetic condition that is the leading cause of progressive combined deafness and blindness in the US and around the world. Needless to say, I have a vested interest in learning this new language. Rebecca sits in a close triangle with a woman, Haley, and a man, Roberto. ProTactile began in 2007, and like all languages, it has its own grammar and syntax. It's communicated with the hands and articulated in contact space, using the arms, shoulders, back, and legs. This padding here is called back channeling, the equivalent of nodding a way of indicating I am following. Hands pat thighs in each other. ProTactile can also provide background information like how many people are in the room, whether they're sitting, standing, or even what's on the television in the waiting room of a doctor's office. Text, creator, Yelisa Nuccio. A woman with long hair graying at the temple sits with Rebecca. Yelisa Nuccio, trailblazer and one of the creators of ProTactile served as my guide. Interpreter Helene Anderson. So I'm going to use our legs and first of all check in with you Rebecca to make sure that you're comfortable. Are you comfortable with how we're arranged? Okay so our torsos are a little far away so we want to be close like this because we're going to be using our torsos and our arms and our legs when we're talking in PT. They sit a foot okay. apart. So we're gonna really just focus on what we're feeling between the two of us. You try to feel me as much as you can, Rebecca, okay? Don't worry about leaning back and trying to see, okay? Just really try to feel my language because that's what I'm expressing is all through touch. Yelisa moves her hands, Rebecca's rest over them. Yelisa was born in Croatia, the only deafblind person in her family. She did not have language until her family moved to the US and she learned American Sign Language. She received a master's degree in public health and in 2007 became the first ever deafblind director of the Deafblind Institute in Seattle. Historically, it's been run by hearing sighted folks. But when I got in as director, we switched to a new model. We couldn't afford a huge budget for interpreters. So we had lots of different programs and projects that we were running and we thought, well, we're gonna do this ourselves, this works. We said, we're not going to be using the hearing sighted norms here. 
we're not going to be abiding by deaf norms either. And people said, well, then what are we going to do? <laughs> because we hadn't been in communication directly historically. And we established a PT zone, first and foremost there. And we said, anyone who comes into this space is not to be speaking in English. So there's no auditory communication here. And there's no visual ASL happening either. Instead, when you come in, what you need to do is walk up to us and touch us. As ProTactile developed and its benefits became clear, Yalisa went on to create Tactile Communications, a learning and education center for deafblind people. She also trains interpreters at the ProTactile House, the first and only of its kind in the world, housed in Monmouth, Oregon, near Western Oregon University. Yalisa touches Rebecca's face. ProTactile language has been researched since 2010, and there are many, many rules, and these aren't arbitrary rules. These are rules that have arisen organically within the language. Rebecca nods. If you think about how a person may tactily access ASL, well, it's akin to lip reading in that we would be missing 70% of the information because there's no contact with our bodies. Everything is up in airspace. 70%. Imagine receiving only one third of what someone is trying to convey to you. So instead, what we use in protactile is a four-handed grammar. We're articulating onto the body of our interlocutor. And now, more and more protactile words are coming into their own. We're not borrowing ASL words as much as we did in the beginning. ASL signs derive from a visual environment, and we want to be articulating what we're feeling. How something feels is very different than how something looks. Rebecca signs to the camera. ASL sign for dog. There's two different signs. First, dog. She waves fingers by her ear. Scratching the ear. Second is dog. Resembling finger spelling. Pro tactile sign for Dog is this. Two middle fingers touch her thumb, forming a snout. Index and pinky stand up like ears. It feels like what the head of a dog feels like. So this is the pro-tactile sign for dog. Text. Educators Haley Broadway and Roberto Cabrera. They sit in a close triangle with Rebecca, each person resting a hand on another's hand and leg. Elisa works closely with Haley Broadway and Roberto Cabrera. We sat in a circle to have this discussion. Pro-tactile is especially groundbreaking because it allows deafblind people the opportunity to communicate in a group. Interpreter Helene Anderson voices for Haley. In this pro-tactile three-way allows us all to know not only that we're all three in conversation with one another, but also where we each are in space and what each of us is experiencing at the same time, that we're all sharing at the knees. Not the eyes and the face, which is hallmark of ASL, but the knees and the hands and the legs. They pat each other's thighs. Haley and her brother both have Usher syndrome and were raised by hearing parents who learned how to sign to communicate with them. She is a pro-tactile instructor for deaf-blind children and their families. Roberto is third-generation deaf-blind and a vocational rehabilitation counselor and teacher for people who are deaf and deafblind. Interpreter Tony Bonney voices for Roberto. The way we're arranged is so that we can share information. We can have a natural, organic conversation. That's why we're established the way we are. And we set up information to be shared on a variety of sources. It could be on your forearm. It could be on your thigh. It could be on your shoulder. It really depends on how you want to express the information being shared and reciprocate that. Text, touch can tell you a thousand words. Rebecca signs as Roberto and Haley rest their hands over hers. So, you know, in the hearing world, there's a saying that the eyes are the windows to the soul. She touches their chests. How do you feel about touch, the way that hearing people have that say. Touch will tell you a thousand words. I mean, you can look at a picture, and yet that tells you a thousand words. But really, touch, it has energy, it has emotion. Everything is right here at our fingertips. I mean, there's so much you can attain. 
and, and our biggest organ on the human body is our skin. So why don't we use it? <laughs> Haley nods emphatically, then signs. Well, a hug is a way to come together and really feel warmth from another human being. But you know, sometimes you get a hug from someone and they lean over awkwardly, their feet are really far away from you, they're leaning kind of back or they give you an awkward pat. That conveys so much information. So there's a soul to soul connection that can happen through touch also. Elisa. Touch oftentimes is a fleeting sense for a lot of hearing sighted people. And what we want to do is broaden our tactile reach so we're not just getting in touch with things and then disconnecting two seconds later. We're really touching something. What is its texture? What is its temperature? What is its shape? So that we can really know those objects and then those can be encoded into protactile language because they originate from a place of feeling. In a sketch, two hands move apart. Text in quotes, distantism. Protactile is more than just a language. It's a philosophy and a movement. The antidote to what deafblind historian, scholar, and poet John Lee Clark has termed distancism. Roberto. How do we know that people even are around us? We don't if they don't touch us because everything is designed for visual and auditory modes. And that is distantism at its finest. Haley. John Lee Clark talks about autonomy in that distantism context. He said, for many, many years, deafblind people were raised with a lack of autonomy because anytime they were in a family environment, going to the doctor or going into school environments, things were done for us. And what that did was prevented us from getting firsthand experiences and figuring out our own sense of embodied experience in the world. Yulisa. For example, if we're gonna touch this pillow, we're gonna do it together. I'm not gonna grab it and then hand it to you. You are gonna be reaching with me in co-presence. Co-presence is an important concept in protactile pro movement because we have power imbalances that occur if we are not in touch and sharing information directly. Rebecca pats Yulisa's thigh. People will sometimes do things for us and then say, here you go, I'm, I'm behaving in a way that's empowering. But you know what, we don't need you to empower us, we have power. Roberto. And of course people, they're not sure where to start when touching. Most people feel very nervous about this, but they can start with our shoulders. It's a very simple and safe place that is appropriate to touch. And just that one small cue is the first step away from distantism. Text, relying on touch. Rebecca in a red blouse and gray jacket. What happened the night that I was invited to dinner to the pro tactile or PT house was a profound experience for me. They were having tacos that night and invited me to join. Cameras weren't allowed and I said, I gotta go. And when I got there, it was completely dark because of course they don't rely on vision or hearing to navigate and I realized that I could see absolutely nothing. I also realized that I was able to hear, and being able to hear put me at a disadvantage if I was trying to learn a language that was based in touch. So I took my cochlear implants off, and I joined them completely deaf and blind in this completely deaf blind world. I was given a tour of the entire house based on touch, and it was so interesting to experience the whole house, not based on what it looked like, but what it felt like. Having to eat tacos with them and figure out how to make it all work and not be able to communicate what I needed by using my voice, nothing other than touch. Well, how do you communicate when you have messy taco fingers? When I was getting ready to leave, my friend Leslie signed on my chest and it, it felt like she was tracing the shape of like a semicircle from my left shoulder to my right shoulder. And I didn't understand. So I asked her in tactile sign, what does that mean? And she was saying goodbye to me. She was telling me that she was, she was smiling, that she was happy to have been with me. And because I couldn't see her smiling, she was letting me know by tracing a curve across her chest. It was such a vulnerable and incredible experience. Certainly not something I think a sighted hearing person would ever think of or even feel comfortable with. Rebecca with Elisa and Roberto. 
about how you, you respond to hearing sighted people. Elisa and Roberto turn to an interpreter. Rebecca voices. Hearing sighted people who say, when you teach a deafblind child to rely on their touch and to really develop their own form of communication, you ostracize them further from being able to participate with the rest of the world. What are your thoughts about this? Yelisa turns to Rebecca and replies. Rebecca and Roberto hold their hands over Yelisa's. So I think the key here isn't just to think about that children need protactyl. It's that anyone in our world who wants to interact with people who are deafblind need protactyl. I mean, sure, you could say that the world is hearing and sighted, but deafblind community is a minority community, as are many other communities. And it's not always on the backs of minority communities to assimilate to hearing sighted norms. We don't want to think about the fact that the community is centered around deaf-blind people, it's not. It's a community that's centered around touch, around protactile norms, and anyone can adopt those protactile norms. The families are adopting these norms, friends are adopting these norms, so that we can all share in tactile space together. We go to restaurants and they bring a cup to the table, they touch the cup to my hand or to the deaf-blind child's hand. You know, instead of putting a cup on the table and not touching me, and I knock it right over because I don't even know that it's there. So again, protactile's for everyone. You don't have to assimilate because the, the world isn't a stationary place that's just decided upon by those in the majority. The world is an eclectic place where we all can share um, and, and figure out how to share together in a modality that we can jointly connect in. Haley and Roberto hug Rebecca, fade to black. Credits, produced and directed by Mary McDonough Murphy, produced and edited by Carrie Lee Green. <laughs> In an outtake, Rebecca, Haley, and Roberto place their hands on the film clapper. Okay. Okay, okay. They clap the arm down together. Sleep. Funding for audio description is provided by the U.S. Department of Education. Sleep.